Coming up, a first look at the newly renovated Shriver Center. But first, Miami's president takes a stand against the Oval Office's travel order. Welcome to Oxford Weekly News. I'm Hannah Jolly. And I'm Sarah Muir. Our top story this week, Miami University President Greg Crawford responds to President Trump's immigration order. Oxford Weekly News' Althea Purley joins us with more. Althea? Thanks, Hannah. President Crawford joined two letter writing campaigns from other U.S. colleges and universities sent to government officials expressing Miami University's concerns about the executive order and support to keep doors open to international faculty and students. This comes two weeks after his email to the Miami community addressing anyone who could be affected by President Trump's executive order, which had stopped travel from seven Middle Eastern nations. An appeals court has refused to reinstate the order. Dr. Crawford joined 600 other college and university presidents in a letter just a few days ago to John Kelly, the new Homeland Security Secretary. And it is in essence said the same thing. International education is very important to this country. It helps drive research and innovation, and it also recognized that universities have worked with Homeland Security over the years in, in supporting those programs through research as well. This comes two weeks after President Crawford's email to the Miami community addressing anyone who could be affected by President Trump's executive order. On campus, there are roughly three dozen faculty and students who are affected by the executive order. The 27 students from those countries have heard from the International Students and Scholar Service Office. Faculty has heard from the President's office. On Miami's campus, there are roughly three dozen faculty and students who are affected by the executive order. The 27 students from those countries have heard from International Students and Scholar Service Office. Faculty has heard from the President's office. Their visa statuses have been checked to make sure they are up to date, and faculty has been put into a premium processing which makes it clear that they are part of the Miami community. Miami students and faculty were urged to respect differing viewpoints for during Miami's first inclusion series session titled Free Speech and the Path to a More Perfect Union. The session was held on February 1st in the Shriver Center. A panel of professors discussed the challenge of having difficult conversations. Around 120 students and faculty attended the event, including President Crawford. The session was the first of a four-part series, which will have monthly events until the end of the semester. To be willing to engage with each other, we support each other in those efforts to bring different perspectives to campus. I mean, that's the real beauty of a university is that it brings all of those folks together. We want to take advantage of that while we've got it. A Miami University police report revealed new details in the death of first-year student Erica Bushick. The 51-page report issued by campus police suggests alcohol was a contributing factor. Bushick, a first-year student from Illinois, was found dead in her dorm room in Morris Hall on January 20th. The Butler County Coroner tells Oxford Weekly News that a determination on the cause of death has not been completed. Toxicology results have not been released. This month, the Miami University community is remembering the loss of one of its own. Rebecca Eldemeyer was a geography and sustainability major. She was killed by her ex-boyfriend on February 1st, 2015. Her co-workers remember her fondly. She was, she was a terrific worker. Um, she'd also just started on a research project with us for the libraries, so it's, it's still sometimes, uh, you know, we pick up that research project from time to time and, and inevitably that, that comes to mind, so that's, that's challenging sometimes. Eldemeyer's parents have started a foundation in her memory about one of her biggest passions, named the Betterment for Environmental and Earth Protection. On February 7th, the Oxford Police Department welcomed its newest patrol officer. The city's newest officer, David Morgan, was sworn in during a city council meeting. Morgan was required to pass a series of rigorous written and physical tests. This is in anticipation for a retirement in October. So the city has allowed us to hire an officer now, um, which will be very helpful because we'll be able to put that officer through our intensive 16-week uh, uh, training program. Morgan is expected to start his formal training soon alongside veteran Oxford police officers. The Talawanda School District opened the doors to a brand new elementary school at the start of the year. I visited the new Kramer Elementary this week to see the unique challenges and rewards teachers in the school encounter. Kramer Elementary's English as a Second Language program is home to over 20 different languages spoken by 50 students 
with the most common language being Chinese. These students make up 10% of Kramer's student population and are grades kindergarten through fifth grade. Nate Silverstein, ESL instructor, says this diversity is due to the unique Oxford community. Kramer has the most need out of our entire district, hands down. And that would be due primarily to Miami University and, and the restaurants in town, which are probably here mostly for Miami University. Linda Buecher, ESL coordinator in the Talawanda District, says the ESL department is closely knit with the community. We become very close to our parents. We have a family dinner night at the um, beginning of school. We um, talk over the <laughs> rules of the school about um, what to do when a student is absent, what to do if, if they're going to go home over J-Turf. Um, so there's all kind of things that they need to know. Joan Stenum, Director of Teaching and Learning at Talawanda Schools, says the number of students in this program is becoming less due to a recent change in Ohio laws that requires students to take a test on learning, reading, writing, and listening that determines if they leave the English learning program. We've been pretty stable since um, probably the last five years in our numbers. They're decreasing a little bit just due to the fact that Ohio has changed how we students exit the program and they're able to demonstrate their mastery of English earlier. And so we're getting more students to graduate out of the program by being assessed as proficient in English. So we may see a small drop as this new test rolls out last year, this year, and the next couple of years. This testing is already underway in Kramer Elementary. The ESL department began testing their students on Monday, February 5th, and will continue until March 31st. The old Kramer Elementary School is set to be demolished by the end of March, but members of the community don't have to say goodbye just yet. The land from the old school will be used as a parking lot for the new school, but bricks from the old building will be sold as part of a fundraiser. A similar fundraiser was held when the old Talawanda High School was demolished, which helped create a $5,000 scholarship for Talawanda grads. A couple of Miami University fraternities and other community groups plan to help with the fundraiser. Coming up on Oxford Weekly News, a first look at the newly renovated Shriver Center. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Oxford Weekly News. My name is Skylar DeBelco. The Shriver Center may look the same on the outside, but has undergone major renovations on the inside. I got to take a look inside. This past January, Miami University's Shriver Center opened its doors after a year-long renovation. With half of Shriver's 120,000 square feet of space ready for use, phase one of the Shriver Center's two-phase renovation project is complete. Miami's Admission Visitor Center, Renilla Learning Center, and Office of Student Disability Services have been relocated from the Campus Avenue building to the Shriver Center. Senior Associate Director of Admission, Carol Richmond, already sees a positive impact since the move. I didn't realize what we were missing in the old space. I felt like it was great. You, I'd been there for more than a decade. But already moving here, you can see the interaction with the current students. And even when you're in the auditorium room, it's veiled but not really closed off so that our families can experience what it would be like to be a student here, what a day in our life is like. Shriver's third floor, which was previously a ballroom, now accommodates Miami Student Disability Services and Renilla Learning Center. Director of Renilla Learning Center, Christina Carubo wettstein has noticed an increase in tutoring services since the move. Even with us being officially open and doing service for one week, our numbers for tutoring and supplemental instruction has already increased. I think that we probably are going to get more students who are willing to come in just because of our location in the central part of campus. Director of Disability Services, Andrew Zeisler, believes that it is important for Student Disability Services to share office space with Renilla. For safety and access reasons, some members of Miami's community have showed concern over disability services being placed on the third floor of Shriver. However, Zeisler is confident that there is no risk to student safety and Shriver's upgraded elevator is able to accommodate all students. The renovation of Shriver was completed within the $20 million budget and phase two is expected to be finished by May 2018. Back to you in the warm studio, Sarah and Hannah. For generations of Miami students, the start of a new semester began with a trip to the bookstore. 
This month, the on-campus bookstore began making changes to its long-standing tradition as it shifts to an online bookstore. The program aims to make buying books more seamless and save students money. Students can expect to save up to 40% on textbooks. The program is set to begin summer of 2017. Miami's Greek community faced hazing and drinking issues last spring that led to three fraternity suspensions. I talked with fraternity leaders about why this year is much different than last. Inner fraternity council leaders are creating culture change among fraternities after the number of alcohol-related hospitalizations decreased from more than 10 last spring to just one as of early February. Allegations of hazing and forced alcohol consumption last spring ended with the suspension of three fraternity chapters at Miami. IFC President Cameron Snyder says a culture change was vital to the survival of Greek life at Miami. Last year, I think, um, there was very much so an environment where um, a lot of different types of behavior that are unacceptable were being tolerated um, and were being hidden from um, the people who needed to know most about them. Snyder says some major changes they've made this year are an enhanced member education program and holding chapters accountable judicially. Additionally, IFC is requiring a new member plan from each fraternity chapter. Vice President of Conduct for IFC, Matt Murtha, says that once these plans were made, chapter presidents were in support. When these new presidents came around, uh, they all really bought into the vision and got on board with us so that now, as we've begun this semester, they know what the vision is moving forward and they've really helped us get to where we need to be and we've seen a dramatic improvement. Snyder's hopes that by making these improvements with judicial issues, there will be more time to focus on other aspects of Greek life. In the next couple months here, I, I really hope to have a bigger focus on other things besides for recruitment and judicial stuff. Um, I like to focus a lot on scholarship and learning, um, philanthropy, community service, stuff like that. Um, as well as a couple of other big projects that we have kind of in the works now. Roughly 640 new fraternity members will be initiated into their chapters this March. IFC's executive board will continue working towards this culture change through the new member period this spring. Daryl Baldwin, director of Miami's Miami Center, has been tapped to give the spring 2017 commencement speech. Baldwin received a MacArthur Genius Grant in 2016 for his work to restore the Miami tribe's language. Having Daryl Baldwin as the commencement speaker this spring shows that the university recognizes the um, very worthy and significant work that he has done. It recognizes his leadership, his passion, and his ability to inspire others. After the break, a Talawanda graduate hits the big time. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Oxford Weekly News. A Talawanda grad is joining the room where it happens. Raven Thomas has been cast in the national tour of the Tony Award winning musical Hamilton. Thomas graduated from Talawanda High School in 2012 before attending the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. Hamilton is set to stop in Cincinnati in 2018. With Valentine's Day right around the corner, thousands of mergers are looking forward to receiving their annual Valentine's Day card from Miami University. Earlier this month, Miami's Alumni Association mailed out nearly 14,000 Valentines to merger couples. Valentines have been sent to mergers every year for at least 30 years, with at least one merger in every state. Looking for more news about the Oxford area? Check out the Miami University Patch site, featuring reporting by Miami journalism students. Right now, you'll find stories about the opening of the new Kramer Elementary, a recent anti-Trump protest, and the Miami Red Hawk basketball team's twin freshman standouts. Visit patch.com and search Miami University to read these and other stories. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sarah Muir. And I'm Hannah Jolly. You can watch us on our YouTube channel. Also connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Oxford Weekly News.